who are maybe uh, suffering from underlying conditions, etc. Uh, it also requires identifying the exposure or risk factors that, in, that increase the risk of the disease. And apart from stopping the outbreak, we also want to prevent future outbreaks and also improve surveillance and outbreak, and outbreak detection. Uh, now on to the steps involved in um, outbreak investigation. There are 10 of them. Um, normally, we follow each step one after the other, but sometimes you may have to, you know, to uh, come from maybe step number one, go to step number five, go back to step number two, like that. So in a nutshell, uh, those steps that I have uh, shown in the previous slide are in a conceptual order. However, in practice, several steps may be done at different times. Yeah? For example, you, should, you can implement some control measures uh, before you even start communicating. Like, for example, in the COVID-19, we were asked to you know, keep uh, social distance, sanitize our hands, um, you know, uh, keep washing our hands all the time, uh, pre you know, uh, avoid contact with the people who have traveled. So you can do that while other steps of investigation are still ongoing. Uh, so step number one is to establish existence of an outbreak and this is done by checking the numbers. Yeah, as we agreed earlier, uh, the, uh, for a uh, disease outbreak, the numbers are usually in excess of what is expected. So you need to know what is the expected number. For example, for COVID-19, we are supposed to have zero numbers. So if you have one coronavirus disease uh, case, then it will be considered an outbreak. So surveillance data in this case becomes very important uh, because it is what is going to guide you on what is the expected number and whether the numbers have gone beyond what is expected. And uh, at this juncture, we need to be aware of artifactual causes of increase or decrease of reported cases. You know, if there is a change in the uh, reporting practice, a change in the case definition or a new technique for diagnosis has come up, it may show like the, the number of cases has increased while in real sense, there's no change, yeah, and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, step number two is to verify the outbreak, and the verification is by confirming clinical diagnosis, and this is done in the lab, yeah, and um, not every case is supposed to be tested. Just because you're showing uh, signs that may, may show like you are having that disease, that not, does not mean that you have to be tested. Uh, so uh, you need also to interview cases, and cases in this case, we mean um, the people who are showing the disease clinical signs. You also need to interview the contacts. Those are the people who have come into contact with someone who has either tested positive or is suspected to have the disease. Uh, number three, step number three, you need to define a case. I've talked uh, previously about a case definition, and a case definition is a set of standard criteria to, uh, for deciding whether or not an individual fits to be a case in a particular outbreak. Uh, so the, the outbreak should be simple, yeah? Uh, it should be. It should include almost all the cases. Yeah, the case definition should be uh, simple enough, but still um, loaded enough to capture all cases that uh, may be may be present in a particular area. For example, uh, we we can um, we can have. Um, different degrees of case definition like for example you can have a suspected case a probable case or a confirmed case depending on whether or not uh, the the case has been you know has been has undergone some lab lab testing to show whether they are positive for a disease or not 
and uh, for a case again to be defined it requires clinical information uh, we are going to see more of this in uh, subsequent slides and you need to describe the epidemiology in this case we describe the time when the disease occurred the place and the person or the animal who is involved you know you need to tell the age uh, the race the, the sex, that is the gender, and many other things, just to describe the case so that you may, you may have an idea of what could be ailing them. Um, so even if one is not a clinician, it would be very important to, um, to review medical records of this case. If it is possible, you need to see this case, you know, see how they are presenting, so that when you see other cases, you may have an idea of, uh, of how the disease is showing. Um, now, uh, different case definitions have different strengths, so we have sensitive versus specific case definitions, and um, for often, to have a loser case definition is more helpful in case finding. And uh, for, for, for loose case definitions, you will have many clinical signs. For example, you, in the case of COVID-19 disease, you may want to include fever, coughing, you know, uh, difficulty in breathing, you know, a range of many clinical signs or many exposures to make sure that many cases have been captured. And as a loser, a loser case definition is more important in case finding as compared to a tight a tight case definition. And a sensitive case definition means that <clears throat> It, it, the case definition has the ability to detect all cases, while a specific case definition ha means that there's ability to exclude as many negatives as possible. So um, it's important to know wh what is your aim. Do you want to capture as many positives as possible, or do you want to exclude as many negatives as possible? Uh, so uh, for... Uh, an example of COVID-19 dis uh, disease case definition, as we mentioned earlier, the case definitions are divided into suspected, probable, and confirmed. According to WHO, a suspected case can be either of these. I will just pick one for purposes of time. A patient with acute respiratory illness, uh, for example, fever, um, and at least one sign or symptom of respiratory disease such as cough, shortness of breath, and no other etiology that um, fully explain the clinical uh, presentation and a history of travel uh, or re residence in a country reporting local transmission of COVID-19 disease during 14, 14 days prior to symptoms onset. And um, there are many, uh, I've seen different uh, different case definitions for COVID-19 depending on which site you you open. But for the WHO, that is one of the case definition for a suspected case. We have case definition for probable and confirmed. A probable case uh, for COVID-19, according to WHO, is a suspected case whom uh, testing for COVID-19 is inconclusive. And this just means that um, the laboratory is not sure. You know, maybe the, the results were not conclusive. And a confirmed case is a um, person with a laboratory confirmation of the COVID-19 infection. Uh, step number four is identification of additional cases and this is again a very important step because uh, this is where you catch as many cases as is possible. So regardless of the disease you're investigating, you should collect as much information as possible. You can uh, you start with the identification information of the person who is suffering, you know, the name, the address, the telephone number, you know, where are they coming from. 
uh, the demographics, the age, the sex, the race, occupation and all that. Maybe even hobbies because there are people who have hobbies of traveling and those will be at a higher risk for contacting a disease such as COVID-19. Uh, you also capture clinical information uh, and this would allow you to verify the case definition has been met. We have already talked about the case definition. Uh, include risk factor information. Yeah, and I've given an example here uh, of COVID-19. You would look at history of travel or contact with a person who has recently traveled or has tested for COVID-19. Uh, still, in uh, additional cases, you need to do what you call line listing. And traditionally, we use a form, you know, where you write the name of the patient, where they are coming from and all that. But afterwards, you, you transfer this information to a table that is called line listing. So it is a table with columns and rows, and each column presents a variable, maybe age, sex, you know, occupation and such things, while the um, rows will be the the number of the case. Yeah, so case number one, number two, number three, like that. I have an example I will flash in a while. Uh, so this simple format allows investigators to scan key information on every case that is update uh, and update it easily. Uh, and even if we are in the age of computerization, many epidemiologists still prefer to use, you know, hard copies because it is very easy to carry it with you. You know, you keep checking and maybe you may f uh, find something that you missed initially. Uh, in epidemiology, a line listing is one of the basic methods used to collect data, display data, analyze, and um, you know, give a lot of information on outbreak information. Uh, it is essential. It is essentially a table that displays uh, rows and case, uh, rows and columns, as I have earlier uh, alluded. So this is an example of a line listing. So you have the columns, which will show the the variables. For this case, probably there was clinical signs of diarrhea and vomiting. So the number one will be the, on these columns. Uh, no, the rows rather will be the case number one, the date of onset of, of the symptoms. Uh, does he have diarrhea? Yes. Does he have vomiting? Yes. Is the fever above 37? Maybe the temperature was not taken. And then you fill in as the cases come. So you can have number one to number 7,000, you know. And if you have used an Excel sheet, then you would be able to have a clear picture of how a line listing can be done. Now for the COVID-19, we can have as many variables as is possible. Yeah, the country, the date of onset of the disease, the country, the age, the sex, the trimester, you know, uh, because apparently the disease is affecting the pregnant more adversely as compared to people who are not. And then you will fit this in the uh, line listing and then you will be ticking yes or no for each particular patient. Step number five is perform descriptive epidemiology. And in previous lectures, we have talked a lot about descriptive epidemiology. And this is where you describe the who is affected, where is it occurring, when did it start, what is it, yeah, is it a viral, is it a parasitic, is it a foodborne disease, and how many have been affected. But we summarize it as PPT, which is the person, place, and time, and uh, you describe each one of it. Now, for example, if you start by person, you describe the personal characteristics, the age, the gender, the race, etc. Exposure, it does he smoke, is, it, is he on medication, uh, leisure activities, occupation, etc. Uh, for place, where did it occur? The geographical distribution. Um, is it near a water supply? Yeah, is it because of a food that was eaten? Or did this person travel to a country that is known to have that disease, etc.? <clears throat> Uh, again, uh, uh, describing the place may help in identifying uh, the vehicle or the mode of transmission of a particular disease. Uh, 
and uh, maps are extremely important yeah including spot maps i currently uh, every time you open the media you will be seeing different maps showing where the COVID-19 is occurring yeah and depending on how much color is on that particular map you will know that the, the cases are so many as compared to others uh, the time of course is very important especially the onset of the particular disease so this uh, characterizes the cases by plotting a graph or what is called an epidemic curve I'm going to show you a diagram of that and um, it is a graph of um, number of cases on the y-axis <laughs> and um, the time of onset of illness on the x-axis and uh, an epidemic curve is important uh, because it gives a lot of information it shows the date of I the illness um, for the first case it shows how the the disease is spreading it shows when the outbreak peaked yeah it shows the pattern of spread it shows outliers and many others as outlined in that slide uh, an example of an epidemic curve is this that was for Ebola. So we know that uh, this first case, you know, it started on the 9th of January, maybe. I don't remember which, which year this was. Yeah, and it will show you when the disease peaked. It will show you outliers, you know, these ones here, where you cannot really relate them to any other uh, case that has occurred. I have another example for the COVID-19 outbreak and this is a distribution of the cases worldwide as of 18th March. So again, it will show you the spread of the disease when it peaked, when it went down, you know, and of course the dates of onset of the disease. So step number six is to develop and test hypothesis. Now, we have done the descriptive epidemiology. We have described the person, the place, the time, the how many and all that. So in this step, you go a step further. You, you rely on the data you have collected on the descriptive epidemiology to carry out analytical epidemiology. And we, as we have already discussed in previous classes, analytical epidemiology answers the question why and how all right and to answer those questions you require to carry out analytical epidemiological analytical epidemiological studies for example cohort studies and case control studies and we have already covered that in class so it shouldn't be hard for you to relate uh, again, to develop and test the hypothesis, you need to I I identify the route of exposure and the hypothesis should be testable. Yeah? And of course, it re relies on the descriptive epidemiology as we have earlier seen. So to generate the hypothesis, you of course use them. Uh, the descriptive epidemiology and to test it you sort out the characteristics that are common among the non cases and the cases and if if the, there's no difference if there's no difference between the cases and the non cases you know s s statistical significant difference then you come up with a new a new hypothesis and that's the next step you reconsider the hypothesis you align the hypothesis to clinical and laboratory and epidemiological facts and if exposure history for ill that is the case versus the non-ill, that is the, maybe the controls, then you require a new hypothesis. Number eight, you perform additional uh, studies. Of course, when you come up with a new hypothesis, you carry out different, stud uh, different epidemiological studies to either accept or um, you know, refuse the hypothesis. Uh, step number nine, you implement control measures and the main reason for outbreak investigation is to prevent and control the disease. So prevent exposure, prevent infection, prevent the disease, and prevent death. For example, keep social distance for COVID-19 disease. Wash your hands, sanitize, 
yeah stay at home quarantine yourself isolate yourself and uh, if you do that your you, at least chances of getting the disease will be minimal so uh, underlying purpose of all epidemic investigation is to control the spread of the disease. I think uh, by now that should have sunk in uh, to prevent morbidity, that is the number of cases, and to prevent mortality, that is the deaths. So quarantine, isolation of individuals to reduce spread, removing possible vehicles, and vehicles in this case include, you know, if there's something like food or water that could be spreading the disease. And for where possible, you can do vaccination. Uh, step number 10 and the last, uh, the last step in outbreak investigation. Uh, is communicating the findings. I'm sure by now you have seen the CS of uh, health, um, you know, ca carrying out press briefings from time to time. So this should be done as a step in outbreak investigation and it should be done by authorized personnel. For example, the outbreak investigation staff, public health personnel, government officials, healthcare providers, media, and uh, for those who are allowed to, you know, there are those people who are at home, maybe may not be able to listen, maybe not be able to, you know, to understand maybe English, you know, you can interpret for them and you do it ethically. Do not give them lies, you know, do it in the right way. Uh, finally, emergency risk communication and you should have principles yeah when you're communicating uh, information about a disease outbreak do not make people panic yeah do not um you know you of uh, emphasize on the process in place you know tell tell us that you're trying to contact the people who have come into contact with the possible cases don't over reassure don't give false information you know if you follow all this um you will be good to go for the communication of the risk uh, challenges that are there in investigation maybe little data small numbers publicity people are, are scared of being interviewed as uh, others are reluctant to participate in outbreak investigation and all that so if you want to read more on outbreak investigation you can read those two books and cdc website and the who website so thank you very much for listening uh, that's the end of our lecture today and please stay safe these televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.